This was amazing. Um, who, I think early on, someone was saying something about how ageist this industry is. And um, I was looking at the opposite. You know, we throw away our elders and I think I'm in the elder category now, I'm turning 60. And so a lot of times now I just listen. I used to talk so much. So it's always funny now for me to use my voice when I feel like I, I need to listen to our younger voices. Thank you for having me. Everyone was incredible today. Um, and what um, specifically motivated me about this conversation is the connection to justice and the work we have to do to dismantle um, our injustice system. My, um, my father was a juvenile offender in Los Angeles. I'm first generation um, born in the US on my mom's side. She came from Mexico when she was nine. So my mom's family are from the Middle East and Mexico. And then my dad's family came from Poland. And I was born in South Central. And I look at my elementary school pictures and I'm always the only pale face. And then in high school, I was um, in a very white privileged area. So we migrated and my dad went from being a juvenile offender in Los Angeles and was in um, locked up in LPN Central to being the youngest public defender in the juvenile courts in Los Angeles. So um, my childhood was in the back of juvenile courts. We couldn't afford babysitters. And my dad had such a profound influence on the lens that I looked at education and law. And I just remember being 10 years old and always asking why white kids didn't get in trouble. And he said they got private attorneys. And then my migration from South Central schools to Malibu was also um, really informed my awareness and and my understanding of that we have two school systems. We have a, a school system for kids who come up in privilege, another for those in poverty. And so in the 70s, I was taking the bus from the west side to inner city cultural center. And I was so blessed to be included and to get to participate and to be among some of the most phenomenal artists that were in California. Bill Summers was jamming there. All the artists that would come to LA would stop in at Inner City Cultural Center. And there were a lot of African artists. When the, um, the world beat music scene started, they would come to LA in the Bay Area. And my mom moved to the Bay when I was young. And, and so I always say I straddled LA and the Bay and that the Bay has such a profound influence um, on activism of any kind. And so um, I, I can't talk about my learning process without talking about the Bay's influence and how blessed I was to, to spend time in the Bay. Um, it, I was never interested in entertainment. People always, you know, look at me and think I work in the entertainment industry. I do work in the industry of, of leveraging arts. I do represent artists, but my intention was never entertainment. It was the power of what art and, and profound voices could do. And um, artists might not lead the revolution, but they will soundtrack it and drive it. And so it was crucial for me um, to understand and, and to contribute. And so the 70s is really, you know, when I became influenced and began to understand the power of arts and that in schools, unless you grew up in privileged schools, we, um, we didn't look at arts in academics. We didn't recognize the power of art. It was always an elective. And arts can't be an elective. If we understand the science of art and the power of music, it's an essential. So um, a little bit more about just what my understanding of art is, then I'll be specific. I'm talking fast, Raman, because I want to make sure you have time. So hopefully everyone follows me. Um, 
I understand for me that, um, that music was the study of the relationship between what was invisible and the tangible. Um, and that, that art allows us to excavate what's inside. And, and I say that because that's what it became for me. I was identity challenged from like my earliest memories. I could not understand who I was. I have a very brown mother. I ended up with a black stepmother. I um, didn't ever feel like I belonged in any world I was in. And so the one place that there was harmony and unity with all of us was art, was music. And we could all come together and shed our external um, issues that, that blocked us from connecting and we could come together in art. So I, I began to see tools in, in utilizing music and art and what it did for me personally. Um, and music has a way of moving our hearts and finding our souls. So I wanted to be part of moving hearts of the masses and although my dad raised me, my mother was very active early on. She worked with Cesar Chavez. She had a lot of friends that were involved with the Panthers. So I had an activist mother who was not um, an available parent, but I still saw what she did in the world. And then I had a, a lawyer father who, um, public defenders don't make a lot of money and they bring every case home with them. And so I saw my dad fighting for black and brown youth my whole childhood. And then he eventually became a judge. And so in, in our family, me being an artist was not, um, it wasn't gonna be accepted, even though I'm saying it's an essential and that we have to recognize the role arts and I'll specifically get to hip hop in a minute. But um, I saw art and music as everything. And my dad was a lot like what I was saying we do with the school system. It's an elective. We all need it. We should celebrate it. But he um, really would have liked to have me follow in his footsteps and, and be a lawyer or a doctor or something that he respected academically. So in addition to the challenges I had with identity, I never felt like I could pursue my dream of being in the arts. So it was always kind of a joke to me. I would sneak off. I was in a lot of bands when I was young, but it was always this thing that I snuck off to join the band. I didn't even take myself seriously, um, but I knew how important it was. And I also um, understood how we are, um, in a country where education is biased, that we have not had honest conversations, we don't address race, we don't address emotional, social and emotional learning and financial literacy. And those are things that from what I understood were crucial and they were absent. And with my family makeup, you know, we had a very interesting dinner table and so we always had conversations about race, but it was always uncomfortable um, to have those same conversations outside of home. And so I, um, I first began hearing rappers and it was the first time musically that I saw that hip hop was able to address black pain in a way that the world could suddenly um, have a soundtrack to this struggle, to what it is. And it's not just um, in this country, but globally, what colonization really looked like on a global scale. And for me, it's not, Black people know Black pain, they live it. But the world needs to have a real honest conversation because everybody suffers if we are not accountable to what's going on. And it didn't matter. I lived in Central America when I was younger. I went to college in Panama and I, I've done a lot of traveling and it doesn't matter where I've gone in the world, black pain 
exists like no other pain. Jews don't have to wear their skin. Women um, have a different experience, but black people, wherever you are, have a different level of pain and, and nobody that's not black wants to talk about it. And so for me, hip hop opened a conversation differently than any other art form. And I saw white kids begin to become accountable to a history and, and to their parents in a way I'd never seen before. I start, started seeing white kids checking their parents. And I really felt like these were conversations that didn't exist in the same way until hip hop. So I, I say that to say that my entry into hip hop and my excitement about Tupac at the time that I connected with him was I felt that we had a framework with this art form for a conversation on a global level that we hadn't had before. And it just opened my heart up and I, I found a passion for addressing um, this work in an academic way creatively. And so um, I'm, I'm trying to talk really fast Roman, <laughs> because I know that, um, that you wanted to share also. And so I'm just- It's all good. This is all recorded. So don't, don't even worry. We'll, we'll okay. share. Okay. So um, again, I, I wanted to get into those same juvenile halls that my dad had me and included me as a child just so that I would learn. Um, and, and I would say that I got in and I was able to do a lot of things because of my father's relationship. So I began by doing assemblies. I, um, I created these programs in the 80s where I would do traveling assemblies and they had two purposes. First, to, um, to be able to address issues that I didn't see in the schools and I would do these 90 minute assemblies and then I would help artists um, that were starting out to get in front of large audiences. We didn't have social media. So if you could do high school tours and get in front of a thousand, 2000 people, you suddenly had access to a larger market. And I had a, the possibility of introducing concepts and ideas. And those assemblies, after doing them for a few years, I went to my dad and asked him to connect me with people he knew in Los Angeles. I was living in the Bay, but I would come down and I began to do these assemblies in the juvenile facilities. Um, a man named Lonnie Morris in San Quentin Prison had heard about our programs and assemblies and he reached out to me and asked if we could do an assembly on the yard. So in 1990, I went into San Quentin to do the assembly and afterwards he pulled me to the side and said, um, you got diamonds in one hand and dynamite in the other and you are about to market gang culture and violence in an unprecedented way with some of the artists that you're working with and you're gonna be coming back to me looking for solutions. And he was in jail. He actually just got out after 44 years. He um, killed an officer in the commission of a crime in um, Oakland or San Francisco in, um, in the 70s. So I, I was a little offended when he said what he said to me. And he said, you will be able to penetrate because of your whiteness. You'll get access. You'll help with careers. And you won't understand what I know. And so because he said that to me and it mattered to me, I began to go into San Quentin on a regular basis and I began to work with a group of men doing life to translate and share information with some of the artists I worked with. And that was my early education. And, um, and at the same time, Tupac's career was taking off. And as some of you were talking today, I was thinking about, um, how angry my dad and my stepmom were at Tupac. And I had totally lost this memory. I think I haven't thought about it in years, but my stepmom who's black from Louisiana, she was so furious because she felt Pac had so much talent and he was 
doing a disservice to the black community by not standing up and being accountable um, to his history and that he was perpetuating a lot of things and, and he straddled two worlds. He was so positive and so negative at the same time. And I defended him so much back then. And as I was listening today, there were so many things if I could go back, I would do differently, but I was young when I started and now my dad's passed away and I, there are conversations I can't have now because he's not here. But now um, that I'm entering you know, that space of being an elder, anytime, whether it's ramen or anybody asked me to show up, I feel obligated to share anything I can and what I've learned in these years of work inside and where, where I've come to because it's that important, because art has so much power. It's therapy for the soul and young people are hungry. They, um, they need this therapy. They need the possibility of all of us that can hold space for their writing, for their creativity. Um, and they understand that, that music brings harmony to a room and to all of us. And so we do need to direct it. And um, what I ended up doing was I spent, you know, 25 years developing this curriculum for emotional literacy. And as I looked at um, what I personally could contribute in terms of utilizing art for education, it was very specifically around working with the hearts of humanity and helping people to understand what it is to be emotionally literate and the mind follows the heart so once you have um the hearts of young people you can take them anywhere you can hand them a book you can do deeper dives into academics we can talk about financial literacy but when we have rooms filled with broken hearts nothing else matters and so i began to um look at how i can um translate what I've learned, put it in a curriculum, and then pass it on. And so anyways, I don't know if I started rambling, but um, that that's where I'm at now. It's um, the focus of the work I do. It's the focus of our nonprofit. And I do still represent artists. I, um, I'm thankful to have an opportunity now after feeling like we made a lot of mistakes in the late 80s and the 90s to be able to work with artists now and to say no or to stand up or to challenge artists to think a little deeper about their lyrics, about what they're expressing and putting out. And we've lost a lot of people and we can't afford to lose anymore. And so it matters to me to be able to address these issues and, and to affect the change. So. Anyway, I appreciate you guys. Thank you for having me. Um, thank you. No, I, I, I appreciate you referencing back to uh, uh, the your 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 OG in the, in San Quentin. Was his name Lonnie? Lonnie Morris. Yes. Lonnie Morris. He got out last month after forty four years. Wow! Wow! Because um, you know, this kind of speaks to that uh, question that was brought up earlier about the challenge of these prison politics and how do we, you know, how do we navigate that uh, for, for people to, you know, cause that, that is a reality for so many people. And, and I want to reference back to uh, Carlos, um, you know, his story about, um, you know, his brother Mac minister, who's still locked up, but, but also has this mental fortitude that I feel like, you know, uh, you know, this is a part of conversation that that he would he would also really be able to inform in a, in a, on a certain level. So um, I, I'm I'm glad that both of those things were brought up. I didn't I didn't know that uh, that story about him wanting to connect with Pac. Um, but do you have any? I, I I guess I guess it kind of speaks to that what you're saying the black experience being kind of very unique in America, um, in some of these um, figures who have who have dealt with you know the brunt of that and and are fortunately still alive have this experiential knowledge um you know uh, do, do you do you have any thoughts on on the challenges or solutions on how to kind of deal with these 
two opposing realities because we have the reality on the outs and then you have the reality on the inside, which is, um, you know, a lot of people have no experience in and don't understand. Um, I think that's part of why I got so involved at USC and the law department. Um, I think that things change when we address policy and procedure. I, um, I began to bring a lot of law students into San Quentin because while we're creating programs, we also have to create new policies and procedures. And Mac ministers my folks that he calls me every once in a while. Um, I, I began to look at how important it is. As much as I resisted my father for years, I suddenly realized I had to sit at the table with people that could actually write things and and do the, the legwork. It's a lot of work to make tangible changes in systemic issues. And that's why when I started out, I also feel it's so important that we look at rap and hip hop and the art form and understand that it was birthed from from the pain of the black community and it has now been commercialized and white people can get um, on the radio before a black person and suddenly launch a career. And we never talked about the struggle and pain that birthed this music and that, um, that we're warehousing black and brown people like we did on plantations. And it's just that real. And so for me, um, that was another complication in the promoting and marketing of this art form and my resistance to people looking at me as someone in the entertainment industry, because I do believe that, that this music was birthed for activism and it is activism in its inception. And I think that when we're dealing with um, incarcerated populations, it's really important as part of the empowering of um, oppressed people um, and liberation that we look at this through an academic lens and we look at um, where this music came from and we have these conversations and it, it helps to shift um, the mentality and, and to help us change it because it's liberation music, it's fight music, it's, um, it's the music that helped partner with those that were fighting to end apartheid. And I, at the time, was singing in a Nigerian band and half the band was from South Africa, the rest was Nigerian. And I was the honorary member that thought I was really talented and realized that um, we were traveling through the South and the Midwest and they needed a pale face like mine to go deal with promoters and the desk. I was just good enough that um, that they decided to include me. And it wasn't until I got on the road and really began. Um, and, and that's the other thing is like, I don't know if I realized that unconsciously, I didn't think I would have to experience um, or even knew the pain that I would endure by having this black family that I had and no one's exempt. But most people that look like me never have to see what I began to see. You know, you have black children, you're a mother, whether you're a black mother or not, you have black children, you're terrified every time your black sons walk out the door. Um, our oldest, Amaria, got killed by the police in Oakland. Did I ever think that I would have to have a personal experience um, and that I would share this pain. No, I didn't even think about it. And so activism is only um, a piece of it. We have to share the kind of pain that drives a different kind of activism and people don't care until they feel it. And so however much I might think that I care to make these tangible changes in law, in education, in music, it wasn't the same as when it suddenly was on my doorstep or when my children's lives were in jeopardy. And so I've um, had to share pain in a way that very few people I know that look like me ever have to see. And so that obligates me to scream every time I can at people who look like me because they don't even feel the responsibility in making these changes and they won't happen until people feel like it's collective in our responsibility. And so that 
in addition to the curriculum that I have, because I think we need tangible tools to make changes. We need policies, we need procedures, and we need curriculum. But we also, in addition to that, need to um, hold those accountable that don't think that they need to, um, to understand. And so that is where my work has shifted because I spent all 30 plus years inside and working in the trenches. And now that I'm older uh, and I can articulate things differently, I'm in rooms with people who look like me um, and, and working in those spaces and, and really looking at um, how I can be effective in, in political ways that you know, 30 years ago, I didn't think mattered. So I don't know if I answered your question. Yeah, no, you did right at the beginning. And, and actually, I was thinking that was a perfect segue into my presentation.